My name is Sara Tasneem, and at 15 years old, I was forced to marry a stranger that happened here in the United States, and he was 28 years old at the time, and I was 15. I basically now work to change laws and advocate for change um, so that child marriage doesn't happen to other minors. I was born in Boulder, Colorado, and my parents actually divorced at five years old. They were both Muslim at the time, but my mom, when she divorced my dad, actually ended up leaving the religion as well. Because of that, we actually ended up staying with my dad. He didn't want us exposed to another religion. He wanted to raise us in his belief system. My dad actually ended up joining a cult and we were raised in that cult from a very young age up until I was forced to marry. My dad remarried twice. Both of those marriages were extremely abusive towards me. From a very young age, I experienced extreme physical abuse and violence growing up. I think a lot of it was directed at me and my brothers because of my mom. She had left the religion and left the group. They thought somehow like my mom was still influencing me even though we didn't even really have any contact with her. It was at that time that he got really a lot more involved in the cult that he was in. That was just a big part of our life. It was just every day we would, you know, we would either be at school or we would be doing some activity within the cult or the community, or we would be at the leader's house. That was basically our, our whole life was just being in that uh, very insular community. We were kind of taught that outsiders were not really okay to engage with. So the cult that we grew up in, it was based in Islam. It was a Sufi cult. It is based in Islam, but it's a little bit different from the Islamic teachings. And like it departs in that you have a teacher who kind of teaches you the spiritual ways of being a part of that group. They are supposed to be your spiritual guide. That is a little bit about kind of the structure and, and the way that worked in our lives is that there was like a grand sheikh who lived internationally and then um, somebody was sent here to the United States to kind of start building a larger following here in the United States. So that person came over in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, which was when my dad moved all of us to California to be closer to that to that leadership. The restrictions that we lived with in the group was that gender roles were pretty strictly enforced. So there was a separation of sexes. So in any like type of community setting, the women would sit apart from the men. Um, there wouldn't be like any dividing line, but just generally like the women would be separated from the men. The women and girls would have different roles in the group. So such as babysitting or cleaning or cooking. And that was generally kind of like what was expected of us. We were expected to serve and the men were meant to be the breadwinners and the caretakers of the family. So as a little girl, it really felt kind of like I didn't feel like a whole person, if that makes sense. I just felt like I was missing a lot of the things that I wanted to do. I really liked to play sports, but I wasn't able to play sports because that just wasn't really allowed. I would have to wear shorts or like if I wanted to join track, I would have to wear shorts, things like that. I just wanted to run and play and be a kid. And um, I've just felt at times that I couldn't do that because I was a girl and it just felt like I wish I was a boy at times because they could do all the things that I couldn't do. But that being said, like the boys in our group were also mistreated. They were forced to work and do hard labor, basically like rebuilding the leader's house, uh, doing like heavy construction and things like that, things that they really shouldn't have been doing as children. So we grew up really not understanding that we had a voice or that we could challenge authority because we were just taught to obey. And we were taught that like, if we went against any of the teachings or any of the adults who we were supposed to be obeying, you know, that would be like committing a sin. Well, me personally, I just learned how to be really quiet and kind of like try to disappear into the background so that I wouldn't get into trouble. Uh, because again, I was extremely abused as a child and I would try whatever I could to not have any attention come on me. So that just meant like kind of being really quiet and trying to just kind of be in the background the abuse kind of started when when my dad remarried for the first time, his new wife was pretty abusive to me and my brother. And uh, so much so that actually when someone, my mom picked us up, we had bruises all over our body and she took us to the police station and reported it. And then they, my dad and his ex had to get like a separation. And then after that, um, he remarried 
It became a blended family because my stepmom had five children and my dad had three. And so when they joined households, at first it was a lot of fun and I had a lot of new siblings to play with. And that was kind of, it was exciting for me and I was really happy um, to have siblings. But then as things kind of progressed forward, um, it got to be a, a really abusive household. And my brothers and I were basically separated out from the rest of the family and we were targets of daily abuse basically just like physical beatings we were again isolated by ourselves we had to stay in a room by ourselves we weren't really allowed to be a part of the rest of the family activities when I was 15, I was living with my mom at the time. I had been reunited with her when I was 12 years old. So I had got to live with her for a couple of years and kind of experience like what a normal childhood was. I was going to, it was my freshman year of high school. I had started seeing a young man my age. He was like a few months older than me. He was playing in the basketball team. So I would go to like his games after school. My mom found out. My mom was not Muslim. She was not a part of the cult. She she had just completely left the religion. So she found out I was kind of hiding it from her. But then when she did, she told my dad about it, not really knowing that my dad was extremely abusive because we didn't really tell my mom about the abuse that we had gone through when while we were living with my dad. And um, I guess she just thought like she would share, I guess, you know, parent experience with him and try to talk through like what the decision was going to be. Basically, my dad told her to send my brothers and I out to visit him in California that summer. I stepped off the plane and basically he sat me down and said that I could not have a boyfriend, I couldn't have sex outside of marriage, and I was damning him to hell if, if that were to happen because of what I did and because I had basically committed the sin of having a boyfriend, then I had to, you know, the sheikh would pick uh, somebody for me to marry. So that summer, I didn't really think too much of my conversation with my dad. After that conversation, I just kind of like wanted to go be a kid and like hang out with my siblings and stuff and, and have fun. And we went to an Islamic conference that my dad was actually organizing and it was taking place in Los Angeles. It was during that conference that I was basically introduced to a man one morning when my dad told me to go and talk to him. There was a man sitting in the coffee shop and he was a fully grown man. He was 28 years old. I was 15. I sat down across from him and I just remember just saying hello. So it was kind of an uncomfortable situation for me. I didn't really know what to do. And he said that he didn't want to wait for a long engagement. I didn't know what he was talking about. I think I was just like, trying to be obedient and I was just like, okay. And then after that, like things kind of went in fast motion and I was basically married to him that night in a spiritual ceremony. I just remember it felt like I was a kid that morning and then it felt like my childhood ended that night. That evening, I was basically taken up to where the Sheikh was staying. He was staying in that uh, the same hotel that the conference was happening. And they had a spiritual uh, wedding ceremony for me called a nikah, which is basically um, an Islamic version of a marriage. I didn't know that, you know, that was going to happen, but then he was able to leave the country with me and he took me out of the country and I didn't speak the language. I was completely isolated from anybody I had ever known. And so I became really dependent on him. And even though he was a stranger, I began to identify with my abuser and what's normally called Stockholm syndrome because he was the only person that I knew. You know, I just thought that I was doing the right thing by God and by what I was taught. And I thought that, you know, I should just be the best wife that I could. And I immediately got pregnant about six months later. We returned back to the United States, the Bay Area. And that's where we were legally married. My belly was like out to here because I was a very uh, teenager. We drove about four hours from the Bay Area to Reno, Nevada, where we went to a drive through wedding chapel and they signed my, my marriage certificate. And basically my dad consented for me because in the state of Nevada at the time, all it took was basically a notarized permission slip saying that my dad would consent to this marriage since I was under the age of 18. That basically put me into a legal trap 
because as a minor at that point, if I had wanted to leave, I could not leave even though he was committing statutory rape because the age of consent in California is actually 18. My pregnant belly was evidence of a rape and so I was basically forced to marry my rapist at the age of 16 and six months pregnant. At the time, I didn't think it was abuse. I just thought this was a normal way of life and this was how I was supposed to live. If any adult had asked me, you know, what was going on, I probably wouldn't have been able to vocalize what was happening because I was also coached and just groomed from a very young age to think this is normal. Like it was normal in our group for virgin girls to get married to older adult men. It happened to most of the girls I grew up with. So it seemed normal at the time. You know, of course, now that I look back on it, I realized that that was grooming and abuse just from a very young age and I just didn't know. You know, after I had my daughter, that's when I started taking my power back. It started by me fighting to go back to school because Again, I was married to my ex-abuser at 15 years old and I was taken out of high school as soon as I was married to him. When my daughter was about a year old, I would, you know, take her to the park. I would see kids my age walking to school and I really wanted to go back to school. I asked if I could, my ex, if I could go back to school and he said that I should ask permission from the group leader. So I went and I, I tried to ask and he said, well, go ask my wife. So I went and asked his wife and she basically kind of put me down and said, like, why are you asking to go back to school? You should be taking care of your child and um, taking care of your family. And that's not like, how would your husband feel if, if you did that, he would feel like less of a man. And it was at that point where I was just like, no, this is something that I really wanna do. I really wanna go back to school. And I decided I was going to do it anyways. And so that was kind of the beginning of me getting out. So I was in my, my child marriage for approximately seven years. And it actually took me another three years to get a divorce once I separated from him. It took a very long time. And during that time, I had two children. I had started going back to school and that was the only way I could leave because otherwise I would have been homeless on the street with my children, which for a time period, I was homeless. For about six months prior to me leaving my ex, I was living on a boat basically in unsafe conditions. And since I had my two children, I ended up couch surfing. And that was when, you know, I decided I was going to leave and I, separated from him and filed for a divorce. My relationship was very unbalanced because I was a child when I was married to an adult. So just from the very beginning, there was a huge imbalance of power because he was an adult. And so he knew how to navigate the world and I didn't. And that meant that I didn't know how to drive and I didn't learn how to drive actually until I was 23. It was only because like at some point he decided that he was gonna teach me how to drive, but everything was basically uh, controlled by him. He controlled all the finances. I didn't have a bank account my entire marriage. If I did work, I remember one time I, I did like a nannying job and he actually made me return the money to the people who I nannied for. He just wanted to have control. And so even when I was going to school, even though he like, he would allow me to go to school, he just would make it really hard for me as well and tell me that I was neglecting my kids. It was just a very painful relationship. I was constantly being put down. There was a lot of emotional abuse. He was always angry. It seemed like I, he would just get angry at the drop of a hat. It wasn't a relationship that I chose or that I had wanted to be in. So I just really, I didn't want to be with him. And I tried to leave multiple times, but each time he would beg me to go back with him. And I just felt that I didn't have any choice because I just felt very trapped in that relationship. It felt like I was living in a prison most of the time. Even though I was free to leave, it just didn't feel that way to me. The day that I decided to leave, I had actually graduated from culinary school and I started working as a chef. I got my first paycheck and I decided that I wanted to take the family out to dinner. And normally, you know, my ex would pay for dinner and he would just complain, you know, it was costing him so much money, but this time I had money to pay for it. I just remember paying for it and he got so angry Angry, and he started arguing with me and when we got home you know the argument continued and I just told him I was like look I don't need to deal with this anymore and I just took my ring off and I threw it at him and I said I want a divorce I don't want to do this anymore that was 
kind of the beginning of our separation. He ended up taking the kids and going to see his parents and he was supposed to return the kids like after the summer and he didn't. Um, and he said he was going to keep them and I said no way so I jumped on a plane and I went and got my kids and it was a very long drawn out basically battle in court. I didn't have the money to hire an attorney. I was a single mom then and he had the money to hire an attorney so I just wanted to get it over with and just be done with it and so I just agreed to whatever his terms were and that was it. I ended up uh, you know keeping my kids even though he had partial custody. I ended up raising my kids the majority of their life. It was a really hard road to get out of that marriage. The day that I decided to separate from him, I did just feel a sense of freedom and like I can finally live my life. And I feel like that was the day that I really started living my the life that I'm, I'm living today. Even though it was extremely hard to um, support myself and my children, I wasn't being controlled by anybody else. It felt like freedom. My kids were my main motivation to continue to do better for myself and to do better for them. It took me a long time, but I started going back to school. I changed my career later on and uh, now I'm working as a finance analyst. And I feel like now, uh, so many years later, I finally like have reclaimed my life and I'm in a, a place where I can talk about my experience and help people understand uh, what it means to be a child forced into a marriage. Now I am 43 years old. My kids are actually 26 and 23. They are fully in charge of their lives. And I went back to school, got my bachelor's degree and then my master's in public administration. And I've been working as a finance analyst for the past 15 years. And I feel that, you know, my life has really gotten to the place where uh, I feel like I've caught up with my peers, although that I'll always feel like a sense that I've missed out on a lot of parts of my life, but I do feel very happy in the life that I'm leading right now. So I started working on uh, my advocacy work in 2017. I was going back to school, getting my bachelor's degree, and I started doing some research on child marriage. And I thought, oh, maybe like my case was just an anomaly or I'm just unique with my experience. And actually at the time I found out that all 50 states allowed for some form of child marriage. And basically what that means is the marriage age is generally set to 18, but exceptions written into the law allow minors to get married either with parental consent or judicial review. And so what I found out was that there were hundreds of thousands of other minors being forced into marriages and the majority of them were girls being married to adult men. And this just set off so many alarm bells in my head and I was just thinking, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one, but here I am, like one of hundreds of thousands of girls. And worldwide, there's actually over 12 million girls worldwide that are forced into marriages. It's a huge problem. The way I got involved in my advocacy work is when I was doing that research project, I actually typed my story and sent it into a nonprofit organization that was asking to hear from survivors. And they contacted me and I wanted to know if I, I could share my story publicly to raise awareness of this issue. And so that's when I started sharing my story publicly across uh, media sites and documentaries and, and uh, various articles. In addition to that, I also started sharing my story at legislative hearings where they were trying to amend marriage laws to set the age to 18 with no exceptions, meaning that would end child marriage within that state. And so that's kind of what I do today is I basically share my story publicly and I also show up for legislative hearings and provide my personal testimony in hopes to end marriage under the age of 18 without exception because what happens at the age of 18 is that you become a legal adult. That means that you can enter into a contract, meaning you can you know, rent an apartment if you want to, you can open your own bank account, you can drive. So as a minor, if you enter into a marriage, you're gonna be really limited to be able to leave that marriage because you can't hire an attorney, you can't enter into a lease or, or leave that marriage. You can't even go to a domestic violence shelter because they'll turn you away. You're still a child and they'll ask for some kind of parental consent. So that is why I advocate for 18 no exceptions. I partner with nonprofit organizations and I basically show up where I'm needed. If you feel like you're trapped in a relationship where your choices and your 
abilities to make decisions aren't being respected, you're probably in a relationship where there's an imbalance of power. And that is actually what domestic violence is. Domestic violence does not have to be violent, like physical violence. It's basically an imbalance of power. And if my story resonates with you in any type of way, and you feel like you're trapped in a relationship like that, just know that there is help out there. There are a lot of networks who will help you 